Welcome everyone to our continuing Rock Center sessions on corporate governance and particularly matters that relate to the ongoing COVID crisis. Our guests today are Henry McVeigh and Nick Bloom, uh, my two favorite macroeconomists in the entire world. Uh, Henry is my colleague at KKR, Nick is my colleague at Stanford, and both of them have rather extraordinary expertise that's highly relevant to issues that confront boards of directors and executives today. Nick is an expert on uncertainty. Nick knows more about what we don't know than just about anybody I can imagine. And having an expert on uncertainty in today's very uncertain times is about as fortunate as we can be. Henry McVeigh is the very rare macroeconomist who actually has to put his money where his mouth is. Henry's the kind of guy who can't just spout off and if it turns out that he's wrong, go, oh well. Henry's the kind of guy who actually gives advice to people who put money at work uh, and therefore I think thinks deeply and differently about how to view the current macroeconomic situation. And with that, by way of an extraordinarily brief introduction to two luminaries, let me begin by kicking it over to you, Henry. What are the current economic forecasts? How is uncertainty reflected in those forecasts and how have those forecasts evolved? Great, and thanks, thanks for having me. Um, and if, you, if we can move to the first slide, um, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about some of the uncertainty and the, and the, the way where, if you can go to um, the next slide. There you go. <clears throat> what you see here is, and there are lots of numbers on the page, I just fo would focus you on the top left-hand side where we look at what's happening with the consensus estimates, and we, we track these from Bloomberg, but what you see is the, the, the best estimate or the high estimate is, is minus two, uh, whereas when you look at the low number, uh, it's minus 10. So pretty extraordinary uh, gap. I, we haven't seen anything like this um, over the history of, of forecasting that we've done. And this comes from 78 different respondents. Um, on the right-hand side, what I show you is some of the top forecasters from the sell side. And you can just look at the variety of, of difference, not only in 2020, but also in 2021 and 2022. And the consensus, if you roll them all up, <clears throat> looks more modest uh, or less uh, with less deviations down at the bottom. But ultimately, these are these are wide gaps with, with dramatic moves. And Nick and I will spend more time with Joe talking about uh, this uncertainty and, and how we're dealing with that. Yeah, and what's really fascinating is if you look at the data on the right and you just look at maximum dispersion over 2020, Citigroup is the most optimistic. They're estimating a decline in a GDP of 3.3% year over year. The most pessimistic appears to be UBS, all right, down 8.2. Uh, and that's, that's a stunning spread uh, in terms of expectations when we're already halfway through the year. Right, that's the other thing to understand. We've got half of the results in, and we're just, we're just now looking over the remaining six months and look at that dispersion. Stunning. And I think you know, if you go to the next slide, it really speaks to um, what's going on. So, if you think about this, U.S. Uh, economy, about seventy percent of it is consumption, and people are trying to get their their head around who's really spending and how much are they spending. So, if you take a step back on the left hand side you see uh, top 10% of Americans now account for about 50% of savings and about 50% of, of spending. And somewhat interestingly, they've actually kept up their consumption in the near term. We, we actually think that's gonna slow in 21, but, but to date they've spent. And on the right-hand side, what I showed here is really how powerful the government stimulus has been. And so wages and salaries in April were actually down 9%. And, and by the way, these are, these are mind boggling numbers in a historical context. Um, that was about 1. Trillion to 1.9 trillion decline um, in wages and salary. Yet at the same time, personal income was up almost 11%, up 2.1 trillion. Uh, importantly, 100% of that increase in personal income came from government transfers or from uh, the, the fiscal programs initiated by the CARES Act and other things that the US government is doing. So uh, to really understand what's going on with the consumer, you can't just think about traditional consumption. There are major factors going on, one in terms of concentration of wealth, and the second is how the government is responding in terms of those uh, unemployed, or in, either in the low and middle income and even the high income. Um, I would also just close with the consumer thinking about that, that there's a real debate on 
on unemployment. Unemployment, less than 70% of the respondents who typically uh, talk about unemployment uh, actually filed their forms last month. Uh, it's, it's, it's down massively. And what you see is that some statistics would say unemployment's about 13%, but if you adjusted for people that were employed that were not at work, it took it up another three and a half percent. So there's still a wild debate, not only on where the spending's coming from, but also who's actually in the labor force and not. And if GDP is, is labor force times productivity, uh, these have huge implications and hence the huge disparity that we've seen. If you go to the next slide, um, you can, I'll just close with some thoughts. I mean, right now the US between monetary and fiscal stimulus uh, has spent about 44% of GDP, which is a, the world leader. Um, it's more than Europe and kind of the 35 to 40%. If you can move to the next slide, there you go. Um, and, and what that's done is it's driven a huge growth in money supply, not the money multiplier, but money supply at a time when um, nominal GDP is contracting, as we just saw. And so a lot of that money that's not making its way into the economy is actually going into financial assets. And if you look at the right-hand side of, of the, the chart here on page four, what you see is about five stocks now account for 21% of the market cap or the, of the S&P. If you look at that differently, the top five stocks now have a market cap that's larger than the bottom 310 stocks in the S&P. So we talked about the S&P being an index, but the S&P is not reflective of the economy. And we can come back to this. It is an index unto itself. Many of the top companies in the index are gaining market share. They're, they're, they're COVID beneficiaries. And so you've seen a real concentration of market cap increase during the pandemic. And the, the final part I would just close with is on the left-hand side, it's even people that are in the business of forecasting earnings uh, in addition to GDP, you need to focus on what the drivers are. And last decade, 100% of the earnings, which you can see in terms of the red line, came from the technology sector, 100%. There was no growth X technology. And as we think about the, tra the transformation towards greater digitalization and e-commerce that we're now facing, that's going to create one more uncertainty in terms of forecasting, but two is it means that you'll have revolutionary changes in industries and the way that uh, the sell side think about um, ultimately projecting these numbers and from you know, our position at KKR, how we think about investing behind these trends. So with that, I'll pause and either turn it, turn it back to Joe or on to Nick. Uh, so, Henry, that was a flood of information that was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, what you pointed out in many different ways is that not only do we have separate challenges in the economy, people often talk about wealth inequality among individuals. We're seeing the same thing in the stock market as well. Huge dispersion and, and you know, reason to believe the dispersion may continue and may even get larger. But before we go to Nick, I want to put you on the spot. We've been talking about the range of estimates in terms of what's likely to happen in the future with GDP. What do you think is going to happen and why? Where do you fall in this dispersion? You unfortunately okay. have to have a view. Yeah, we do. I mean, as you know, we're $200 billion asset manager. I also serve as a CIO of the firm's balance sheet, which is about $15 billion. So I'm thinking about these issues every day. Um, for GDP, we're at about minus 6.5% this year. And so what's incorporated into that is that you have a, a notable increase in employment over the next two months. Remember that about 70% of the job growth the last six months before the, the downturn was in three sectors, business services, education and healthcare, and travel and leisure. And those have been the hardest hit areas. We actually think you'll see some job growth in those areas before employment levels out and in going into the fourth quarter. We also incorporate into our forecast that there is another program uh, in terms of probably a trillion dollar uh, stimulus package that does help consumption continue. Um, and then the final thing I would say is while we're not calling for an explicit second wave, we do believe in the United States that um, new cases is going to continue to stay at a fairly robust level given um, the government's policy around opening up potentially too quickly in, in, in several major major areas, you're seeing that bear out, bear out the numbers. Uh, hugely important, and thanks for that insight. Nick, you're an expert on uncertainty, and we've already had a hint from Henry's pres presentation that the amount of uncertainties we see in the economy is unprecedented. Just look at that span, all right? Look at the range of, of the expectations 
that are generated from firms that are supposed to be the experts in this space. The experts can't agree. Nick, what can you tell us about the science of uncertainty and about how all of your research around uncertainty feeds into the current environment? Well, well you're right. I mean, uncertainty is just at incredible levels right now. So in fact, I'm gonna pull up some slides as well. Uh, so if you could pull up my slides, thank you. So uh, as backdrop, my PhD that I started back, well, I completed back in the uh, late 90s was actually on uncertainty. So I've seen 25 years of data and on the left is actually a graph of exactly what Henry is talking about, which is disagreement uh, of one year ahead GDP forecast for the US. Uh, it comes from the survey of professional forecasters. So there's about 40 forecasters, KKR, Goldman, JP Morgan, et cetera, each year. And you know, before the pandemic, basically people agreed there just wasn't much variation. You know, Goldman's may say 2.4%, JP Morgan may say 2.2%, but you know, you're really splitting hairs there. Suddenly, as, as we've just been discussing with John Henry, there has just been an, an explosion and disagreement over what GDP growth rates are gonna look like. And you've seen differences of, you know, up to six, 7%, because frankly, nobody knows. There's incredible unknowns, just to be clear what they are. There are unknowns medically. So there's a, you know, I, I was actually involved in a uh, large uh, debate in Stanford, almost like presentation, uh, including from several of the faculty in the medical school. And it's very uncertain over, you know, the progress of vaccine trials and how long, you know, it would take to roll these things out. So there's a big medical uncertainty hanging around us. Probably the best bet is something like a year from now, we may see vaccines. There's also policy uncertainty. It's not entirely clear whether Congress will pass more stimulus, how the Fed react, what will happen in the election and then on businesses and consumers how they're going to respond uh you know in particular post the pandemic are we going to see you know social distancing evaporate or are we going to feel so uncomfortable we never want to get in an elevator with someone you know ever again so that's all wrapped up in this uh increase in uncertainty on gdp forecast on the left on the right is another measure i developed with two colleagues of mine one at chicago university and one at northwestern which is called the economic policy uncertainty index and it basically scrapes around 2,000 US newspapers each day for the frequency of articles that discuss economic policy uncertainty. And it's averaged to be 100 before 2010. So you can see now, I mean, again, it's just incredible levels. You know, on average, uh, this index is around 500 uh, in post-pandemic. So just, I, you know, I personally have never seen anything like this. You have to really go back to the Great Depression to see you know, if you have data about that far, uncertainty levels of this, this magnitude. So we can go forward a slide, thanks. So another way to measure it, I've actually been working also with the Bank of England in the UK, and we put together a survey called the Decision Maker Panel. And uh, this was after Brexit, so right after Brexit in 2016, it was pretty dark times for the UK economically. So I got together the Bank of England and Nottingham University, we put this survey together and it covers around 3000 UK firms per month. So it's the largest regular survey, uh, covers about 10% of actually all UK employment. So it's kind of pretty representative. And we had this question right from the beginning asking about Brexit. So we asked, how much is Brexit a source of uncertainty? Is it the top source for firms? Is it your, one of your top three, one of many or not at all? And of course, from March onwards, COVID, uh, you know, came up as another major threat. So we, of course, included a question on COVID. And this is the share of firms week by week that are reporting COVID as their largest source of uncertainty. And you can see at the beginning of March, right, really at the, kind of, you know, the, stop, the first day of the stock market fall in the US was February the 23rd. So we can kind of date the pandemic awareness from them. But so this is early on. Beginning of March, 25% of firms report COVID as their largest single source of uncertainty. Uh, you know, Brexit was listed by another 25% of firms. So it's kind of a battle, an economic battle between King Kong and Godzilla, Brexit versus COVID. Um, you can see COVID won, you know, COVID, it just became to dominate the landscape in the UK, which is very similar to the US with around 90% of firms from mid-March onwards. And it's dropped back, back down again, but it's still totally dominant economically. You know, the biggest driver of uncertainty for firms is still the majority is COVID. There's a bit of Brexit and there's a bit of other idiosyncratic things like, you know, CEO health or major customers. But this is just, you know, uh, I, we are, I have never seen anything like this as a driver of uncertainty. And if we go down a slide, thanks. 
So another measure that I like a lot, uh, again, a very financial measure is the number of firms that have abandoned earn or suspended financial guidance. So, you know, again, before the current pandemic, I'd never heard of firms, you know, these are main, you know, famous S&P 500 firms, FedEx, Walsh, uh, FedEx, you know, GE, Starbucks, et cetera, have basically said, it is impossible to forecast our business. So we're just pulling all our guidance. And, you know, that just tells you how uncertain, you know, large companies are. And we can see by now more than a third, you know, reaching more than a half of firms have just entirely pulled guidance. So for Main Street, as in actually, you know, US firms that are driving uh, economic growth and consumers and media, we've seen every measure of uncertainty seems to have peaked at incredible levels in April. So next slide, thanks. So I'm going to end uh, by pointing out what seems to be kind of odd in the last two, three weeks is this divergence between Wall Street, uh, the stock market, and Main Street, what I mean, the, kind of the real economy. So here I've plotted a number of different measures of uncertainty week by week, going back to the beginning of 2020. And you can see almost all of these peaked in mid to late March. So that was, you know, the very, uh, the very worst of the fears and uncertainty around the pandemic. If you look at the main Wall Street measure, the VIX, the one month implied volatility, that's in dark blue, that has fallen back. And in fact, I mean, it had a little blip this week, but it's fallen back down. And it's, you know, still high, but it's now in the, in the mid 20s. And so it's at a level that wasn't particularly outrageous before the current pandemic is high, but it's not, you know, notably high. If you look at Main Street measures, so uh, consumer surveys, firm surveys, the media economic policy uncertainty index, these are still incredibly elevated. So, you know, much like there's a divergence in levels, Wall Street is rebounding and the US economy is performing poorly. There's also seems to be a divergence in uncertainty. So Wall Street appears to be very sure of itself with the VIX, you know, dropping back down to elevated, but not notably high levels, while Main Street, the rest of the economy still remains incredibly uncertain. With, with that, I'll, I'll pass back to uh, Henry and Joe. Thank you very much, Nick. Again, another flood of information, but let me drill down on a very important point. A lot of your scholarship deals with the fact that uncertainty itself is a drag on investment behavior and on economic performance, right? And many of the traditional macroeconomic models are perhaps incomplete or not as complete as they could be because they don't measure the effects of uncertainty. Uh, and if you just stop and think about it, the, the connection is obvious. If you're uncertain about the future, what's your incentive to invest, all right? There's a negative feedback loop there. Given the extraordinary, unprecedented levels of uncertainty we see, Nick, how do you see that affecting growth forecasts in the future? Well, there's a, there, you're exactly right. There's a huge debate right now on you know, the alphabet soup of recoveries. Is it a V-shape, a fast drop in recovery? Is it a U-shape? or a Nike swoosh, Nike swoosh, like a drop and gradual recovery, and an L shape, a drop and really no recovery. And I think uncertainty, indicators of uncertainty are extremely useful for plotting out between these. And in fact, the literature on this goes back to Ben Bernanke, so the, you know, the former Fed chair, his mm -hmm. PhD thesis uh, was actually, as it happened, on a kind of similar topic to mine. It was on the impact of uncertainty on the economy and how it delay, can cause recessions and slow down recoveries. And so what I, you know, what, what's going on here is if uncertainty remains as elevated as it is now Main Street, we're not going to see businesses reinvest. So in order to restart the economy and have a rapid rebound, we need a surge up in investment. CapEx, I'm not so sure of US figures. I have some data on UK figures, which is similar to that. CapEx is about 50% of its pre-crisis level. So it's, you know, collapsed. Uh, hiring is, you know, has dropped down. Consumer spending is rebounding. But in order for... CapEx in particular, and in a hiring to bounce back and drive a rapid recovery, we need uncertainty to come back down. So if you're a firm, you know, think about you know, some company, you're not gonna go out and rapidly invest and rehire if you're very uncertain, you're gonna wait. And of course, if every firm does that, that's gonna kill a rapid recovery. So without a drop in uncertainty, it's very hard to see a, a rapid V-shape. And I think it you know, portends a more gradual, you know, as I'm completely aligned with Henry, I think over the next couple of months, there's gonna be a snapback in some employment so some jobs that are temporary furloughs are coming back, but we're still going to be way below the level we were before. And in fact, there's going to still be a bigger drop versus 2008, 2009. So we're going to, going to bounce back to the, like, the worst part of 2008, 2009. And from that point onwards, I fear it's going to be a slow crawling recovery.
Henry, I know you're on top of these CapEx figures. Anything you want to add to what Nick suggested? <laughs> Just a couple of things. I mean, one is, you know, um, investment's supposed to equal savings, and we've got a 33% savings rate. So something's going to have to give here <laughs> at some point. Um, you know, ultimately, look, we, we have 177 companies globally. You know, we live and breathe this stuff every day. I think what Nick is saying is, is correct, which is most companies will do the basic spending that they have to, and then they'll, they'll adjust. Um, you know, what you saw on employment, uh, re it, you know, if you go back and look at past recoveries, it used to take whatever, 36 months. And then, you know, the last one, it took almost 10 years to kind of get back to really adding people, you know, and this one will take longer because what I said about digitalization. So, you know, with employment comes CapEx. And ultimately, I think we're going to have a, a sharp number. You know, we're almost using a square root <laughs> type growth rate, right? Things spike back up because of the stimulus. And then ultimately, it starts to, um, to flatline because the uncertainty is high. And that will, so what will happen is you'll see CapEx in areas where you know there's in demand, things like telecommunications, things like logistics and warehouses. But in terms of building big plants that are, you know, have to assume uh, people go back to urban areas or, or you know, that their healthcare is uh, secure, that's going to take time. And that's what the data shows, um, you know, uh, both from a macro standpoint, that's certain, certainly something we see across our portfolio companies. Yeah. Now, both of you have commented on the gap between the real economy, Main Street and Wall Street, where stocks are doing well, a subset of stocks are doing particularly well, uh, and a large swath of uh, U.S. citizens are really suffering. Um, uh, Nick, I wonder, could you expand on the causes of that gap and potential future implications? I think there's two or three drivers of what's going on. Um, one is obviously interest rates are incredibly low, so that pushes up Wall Street. I mean, the basic idea that you you got to put your money somewhere, and you know the return on our fixed income and bank savings, if you like, is incredibly low. A second factor, exactly as Henry pointed out, there's been an incredible jump in the U.S. personal savings rate. Just amazing. Again, I've never seen anything like this. So you can go and look at data from the national accounts and look at U.S. personal savings rate. And, you know, it moves over time. And economists used to get really excited about moves of half a percent. Like, wow, the personal savings rate has gone from seven to seven and a half percent. And we'd, you know, we'd have a drinks party to celebrate. Currently, it's gone from seven percent in uh, January, February this year to 33%. So it's gone up by, uh, you know, so it's, it's gone up from basically more than threefold. So that is just an immense amount of money that the uh, con American consumer is saving. And Why that is that happening? It's happening exactly as Henry pointed out. Um, the top half of Americans, so frankly, people like us and probably almost all your listeners are mostly still getting the same income as they were before, but we're not spending money. I mean, if I think of myself just personally, all my holidays are canceled. I can't go out to shops. You know, I have four kids, but we can't do anything. So what's happening, that money is just accumulating in my uh, savings account. And many people are opening up, uh, you know, investing that in the stock market. Where else are you going to put the money? So that's the second driver. And then the third driver. But wait, but wait, we've got, let's also talk about the bottom half. All right. The people that are not on this webcast, the people, you know, that are not listening to us, they're getting crushed. All right. And the number of bankruptcies that we're likely to see, the number of people who can't pay the rent, the number of people, you know, who, who, who are out of jobs. All right. And living on unemployment. And it's it's that gap was bad heading into covid. It's going to get worse. Yes. It's another I mean, the, in some ways, the two worst economic things to come out of covid are one, the slowdown in growth. And it's both. The I mean, I love Henry's square root. I was thinking, you know, I don't know if you patented that shape but that's better than any uh, alphabet letter the square is exactly right uh rapid short rebound but a flat line so that you know that's pretty pessimistic on growth the other thing is it's going to dramatically kick up inequality and both short and long run so explain on the long run it's not as obvious on this which is right now there's a an explosion of working from home in fact is the other thing that i'm working on and what we see is the top half of the u.s economy by income are basically working from home the bottom half is right now either on premises, or, but a lot of them are getting stimulus checks from the government. So you may think that's good, they're getting income. There's a huge problem though, in terms of accumulating experience and skills. If you're unemployed for the next six to nine months during the recession, you're really damaging your long run earning ability. So inequality, well, you know, we're setting a time bomb for long run inequality that you know, the rich are getting more skilled and experienced, they're remaining in work, 
the less educated and less skilled are basically many of them are not working and you know they're storing problems for the future so you know there is a major problem with inequality and i think that actually has a big implication for policy going forward so i think when we need to raise taxes given how much you know the, it's basically this pandemic has hurt the young and the poor we're going to see the groups that pay taxes i think i suspect they're going to be the older and the rich uh there's going to be a sense of not quite retribution but kind of evening the scorecard particularly obviously the democrats uh win in november so over to square root mcveigh you've got a new nickname over here <laughs> <laughs> i i know that in that that inequality in all of its forms is something you've been focusing on for many years how do you perceive the situation evolving now I mean, look, ultimately the U.S. right now spends about 10 to 20 basis points on worker retraining as a percentage of GDP. And in, in the developed world, that's second uh, from the bottom, just only Mexico is below the United States. And so that's a, that's a massive issue. And if you go back to the chart I used where I talked about 100% of earnings coming from technology, that speaks to exactly what Nick just referenced, which is um, skills-based learning is going to have to be accelerated at a time where it's actually not working in our favor. And so that's going to have to be both private sector working hand in hand with the, with the, with the government. But, but the near term is that uh, you are having, you know, you're having issues where the unemployment, unfortunately, is hurting some of the lower income, it's hurting in urban areas. And ultimately, I, you know, I think that that's going to lead to political change and, and policy change. And so, you know, most downturns, uh, while everyone's different, typically what you see coming out of this is a, is a shift in policy. And so we'll learn more about this in November. But ultimately, um, when you do look at income equality, uh, it's, it's about as extreme as it was since the early, uh, late 1920s, early 1930s. And I guess I would just say, as a, as a son of a former headmaster, look, education is the greatest agent of change. And education comes in multiple forms. But the pace of learning and the pace of change in the workplace today is accelerating. It's not decelerating. And so as we think about worker retraining, it has to be a massive focus on a go-forward basis, given um, the, both the headwinds and the tailwinds that I've mentioned around uh, digitalization, e-commerce. Um, and also, I just think that, um, and, and Nick is working on this stuff, uh, consumers are going to think about uh, where they work. They're going to think about how they shop. They're going to think about, um, you know, what is safety, you know, healthcare safety, food safety, all those things are going to shift. And so it's a very, you know, as we've talked about, it's an uncertain time. It's a dynamic time. And typically you get economic winners and losers coming out of that. The stock market right now is saying that uh, these winners will be very concentrated. Ultimately, I think policy will have a different say of that over time. And that, that's where I would stay focused. Right. Both of you are now in policy realm, and I think that's really going to be a great way to wrap up our conversation. Let's, let's start by looking in the rearview mirror. Let's look at the policies that our government and other governments have adopted to this point to address the issue. I'd like to ask both of you, give those policies a grade. All right. Have they been big enough? Have they been too small? Have they been too large? Have they been appropriately targeted? Uh, have they been reasonable given the constraints and the uncertainty that we're operating under? Love to hear both your views on that. And then we're going to shift to the question of going forward. What do we need to do going forward? So backward looking. All right. Nick, what do you think? How would you grade the U.S. response? Well, Joe, as you know, you know, Stanford has just changed its grading format this quarter <laughs> so we've gone from you know a a minus b plus to uh an emergency pass or fail so i think i would give congress and the fed an emergency pass um you know a couple of points that are really interesting that are, that, are, that are different one is the whole economics profession the policy profession has become much more keynesian so before 2008 2009 you know, the orthodoxy was in recessions you know, it wasn't to do too much, cut interest rates a bit, maybe increase spending, but nothing too radical. 2008, 2009, of course, we see a top and a huge, you know, monetary and fiscal push. This time around, it's that on steroids. So, you know, they were so fast out of the gates in terms of massive monetary push from the Fed, all kinds of creative policies, and also spending out, some spending out of Congress. So I think they've done extremely well on that front, and we've avoided what could have been a 29 to 33. In fact, I was writing blogs back in... Uh, early March saying, look, we could see another, we could see the greater depression, the worst in the great depression. And I think they were very successful about intervening. The other thing I think that's interesting politically 
is, is compared to 2008, 2009, the Fed has taken on much more of the activity this time around. And I think the honest driver of this is that no one really trusts the current executive. You know, the president and his administration are not seen as particularly competent, and Congress did not want to give too much of the power to them. So the power has been pushed into the Fed. I mean, Jay Powell has made all the running. If you think back in 08, 09, Hank Paulson was a major player. Mnuchin is not a major player this time around. And that just reflects the perception of incompetence in the current administration. But it's, it, I, I think it's been somewhat problematic. While the Fed has done a great job, they are limited on what they can do. They cannot bail out companies. They can only make loans. And that is a big driver of the Wall Street bounce, is that the Fed, in its need to re generate economic recovery, has been constrained on what it can do. And it's basically a lot of that is channeling money into larger firms and hoping that trickles down. So the uh, Fed in particular is, is done fantastically well, but it's highly constrained. It would be far better if actually we could have done more of this to the tax system. But uh, you know, our government currently is honestly not up to the job. Henry, would you also give the government an emergency pass? I would, I would. I mean, if you think about um, what happened in March with the Fed, they were spending 80% more uh, on, on buying than, the, than they were 80% um, more than after Lehman went bankrupt. Most people don't remember that QE actually didn't start till March of 2009. That, that's kind of forgotten, but it was actually, so they've moved swiftly, they've moved in size. Again, I just reiterate, you know, between monetary and fiscal, it's been 44% of GDP, which, which is dwarfs anything we've seen in history and dwarfs most of the other major economies. Um, I would say the other thing is, I think, you know, on the Treasury, they've actually listened a lot and they've made adjustments. If you think about small businesses, you used to have to have 75% of the money would go into employees. Now that's down to 60%. So they've been adjusting the program uh, along the way. Um, you know, look, the, the things that I think where people may poke holes in the argument over time, one is um, they've certainly given a lot of, you know, the, the, the large companies have benefited. I'm not sure the large companies today need as much support in the investment grade market. Really where we are being hardest hit in this country is the small to medium sized businesses. And that should continue to be an, an area of focus. The second thing I think that we have to wait to judge is remember, let's go back to Europe in 2011, where they're, they everybody embarked on an austerity campaign too quickly. And that ultimately led to disinflation and slow growth. And so what will be critical is that the central banks around the world hold these assets for some time and let them mature, and they don't push back on Treasury and other uh, government agencies to try to narrow the deficits too quickly, and, and you have a you have a problematic issue. But make make no mistake, the policy right now is to hold nominal interest rates below nominal GDP. Right when you get in a you know rut like this, you either you devalue your currency, you deflate your wages, or you default on your debt, or you hold nominal interest rates below nominal GDP. Uh, and try to, to try to resuscitate the economy, uh, the economy to kind of make the debt go away and make nominal GDP grow. And so we, in the last cycle, we didn't have nominal GDP grow. It just didn't. And so that led to an, you know, a, an upward move in, in, in financial assets, but the money multiplier never took off. And so I think that ultimately on this cycle, what we want to watch is, again, um, managing uh, the austerity provisions. And then two is you've got to create, back to our point on confidence, so you get capital expenditures investments, but ultimately you have to get the money multiplier working so that there's some money creation and that will create some faster nominal GDP. If we're going to put people back to work and we're going to have deficits get reduced, nominal GDP has to grow. And globally it's gone, since we've gone to negative interest rates, uh, after, after the 2008 event, we've gone from zero negative interest rates to 14, to 14 trillion in negative interest rates. And at the same time, nominal GDP has gotten cut in half from 12% to 6%. That, that's not what they were shooting for. Well, that's, that's a pretty gloomy prospect. And now let's, let's wrap up by some forward-looking projections in a realm of maximum uncertainty. So we're, we're basically throwing darts in the dark here. Uh, Nick, what do you think the government should do and what do you think it will do, U.S. government forward-looking? Um, what I think it, I mean, right now in terms of what it is doing, it's, it's continuing to run most of the policy through the Fed. What I'd like to see is more uh, fiscal policy. 
Uh, it's a, it's an open question as to after the election what we see. So we've run up historically high levels of debt. So debt to GDP is going to surpass the levels we saw after World War II. And if you look back after World War II, in order to pay down the debt, U.S. pushed up tax rates. And in fact, the top rate of federal income tax went to 90 percent. What we're going to do this time around is a, is a good question. I think if the Democrats win, we'll like to see increases in corporate income tax. So company taxes are going to bounce back up. We're going to rescind some of the Trump tax cuts. Uh, top income tax rates will go up. We couldn't even see a wealth tax. If uh, the Republicans win, it's less clear to me. Uh, you know, there used to be a big zeal in the Republican Party to push down debt and have, you know, very tight budgets. But that seems to have disappeared. So I, my guess is more would just carry very high levels of debt going forwards which is fine. We can live with that. Japan has over 200% debt to GDP. The only problem is it's kind of like we've, uh, we'll be in Italy land. We'll be in a country that has such high debt to GDP levels. If we get hit by another pandemic or imagine there's a massive earthquake in California, we need, you know, bailout cash. We've got so, you know, less scope to uh, act again in future. And so, you know, we've just lost a major bullet. So I, you know, I personally am somewhat nervous about carrying too much debt and I'd like to see some of it wound back again. And as Henry says, there are various routes, but I don't see growth as the big driver. I, you know, Henry Square Root McVeigh, I'm like, I'm aligned with that. I think it's the square root growth rate, which is not very optimistic for growing a way out of debt. So, and if you don't want to inflate your way out of debt, uh, the only option is to put up taxes. So I would probably be in favor of a moderate tax increase. And, and you know, in terms of inflating our way out of debt, uh, governments and banks have been doing everything they can over the last decade to try to increase inflation. And we've been unsuccessful along those lines. Uh, it looks, uh, I think the danger of deflation short to intermediate is more significant than the danger of inflation. You know, it's hard to tell. I'm amazed at where this money has gone. Remember, the Fed has pumped, you know, trillions of dollars into the economy. Uh, it's being, you know, it's monetized a lot of the government debt and that cash is out there. It's in physical electronic form. A lot of it's been held on the balances of, uh, of banks. So banks, partly through uh, increased regulation, are forced to hold higher balances. A bunch of it is in the personal savings account of Americans and, you know, internationally. But at some point, that money could come back into the system. I think we have, you know, a big unknown out there. It's like dark matter in the, uh, out in space. You know, there is a huge amount of electronic money out in the economy. And it's possible that could come back. You know, the big fear is actually if inflation takes off, it could snowball. So, you know, imagine inflation starts to creep up to 3 4%. Suddenly, in banks and individuals don't want a lot of that cash sitting in their accounts. They go out and spend it. That pushes inflation up. That means they get rid of more cash. So the thing is not totally stable. That's you know, my fear that something spikes up inflation. Imagine an oil price shock or a devaluation or something that kicks inflation up. So I'm not entirely comfortable with the enormous amounts of cash that are out there. But I mean, so far, so good. And of course, deflation is the biggest threat in the short run. Henry, forward looking. So um, I would say a couple of things. One is I think the near term is deflationary because the money multiplier is still not working. Um, ultimately, for us to get inflation, you'll have to have more money directly going into the consumer where they just spend it and you create demand pull inflation. So near term, we're kind of in the disinflation camp, but we are watching this change in policy where the government is doing helicopter money and does that lead to inflation, but it's not our, our base view. In terms of what we need, look, we need to create incentives for people to go back to work, not to be out of work. Right now, um, the average person that's unemployed is making about 114% of their, their base pay pre-coronavirus. So I think you need to create a, an incentive system uh, where people are incented to go back to work, companies are incented to hire, uh, and you see, you see some of this in, in Europe. You have a heavier hand of government, but ultimately their unemployment rate has been lower, and so that's important. I also would create tax incentives that uh, encourage reshoring. Um, I think that's an, an, an easy win. And I also would, um, I would spend more money <clears throat> on worker retraining and I would try to come up with one mandate that everybody agrees on around infrastructure. That's certainly where I think Europe's headed and I think the US should, should try to do that. I do think we'll see modest tax increases um, at, at, to start um, over time. It, it seems to me that that's the, the way we're headed. Um, but I think you got to take baby steps. Um, that, that would be my, my, my major, which is you need to create positive reinforcement. And that comes from worker retraining, uh, encouraging companies to spend on things here, um, and ultimately incenting um, uh, Americans to go back to work and creating benefits for them doing that. 
you can't have a long run system that's predicated on people getting money for for um, being unemployed, and that's not what Americans want. They they want to work. That that confidence creates savings. That confidence creates the desire to to spend over time and to create uh, better household formation. And so those are the long term drivers, and ultimately they create productivity. But again, I get back to I'm very focused on this technological issue, and I think we're going to have to focus on creating jobs for the the next America. And given some of the dislocation we've already had, um, that's going to take time. But that that's where I would be be focusing. And I think to Nick's point, um, what's happening this fall with the election has huge ramifications. As a country, we're pivoting to the right around borders, and we're pivoting to the left around uh, social inequality. And these these are going to be very high profile issues that dictate policy uh, well into 2021. But my 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 gut is is that. Ultimately, the framework, if you look at history, would suggest um, that you do enter a higher tax regime. And we just need to be thoughtful about that so that you don't create disincentive back to our earlier conversation around CapEx. CapEx ultimately helps to drive jobs, it drives productivity, and it keeps inflation low. And if you don't do that, you run the risk of, of running into modern day stagflation with high deficits, which is not necessarily a pretty picture. You know, the other upside I'd say is, as Joe, you and I have talked about, there's a massive amount of money um, being spent around um, the vaccine. And ultimately, you know, I do think you have to hold out hope that the American economy and the American people are able to deal with this in a better framework than what we saw during the first quarter and the second quarter of 2020. And, and I'm optimistic about that. You guys are great. I hope everybody now understands why you're my two favorite macroeconomists. We've got Nick, nobody knows nothing, Bloom, and we've got, and we've got Henry Square Root McVeigh. Uh, really, thank you both. You guys were absolutely great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks very thank much. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. It was great. Thank you.